Welcome to the Tudor Dixon Podcast, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited because my good friend Rabbi Arie Lightstone is joining us for an update from Israel. As the 2024 election looms and Joe Biden is struggling with questions over his mental fitness, his ability to broker deals on the world stage is on display as well. And it seems when it comes to Israel, his actions have been more political in nature than executive. Biden's support for the from the Arab population has plummeted from 59 percent to 17 percent. That's more than 40 percentage points. And that is freaking him out. Those numbers seem to be impacting his decision and the language around his discussion of the war in Israel right now. That's what I want to talk to the rabbi about. Rabbi Lightstone is the former advisor to the former U.S. ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, and the author of the book, Let My People Know. Arie, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to see you. Nice to speak with you. Very good to have you here. I've been watching this. I think we've all been watching this, but something struck me and you wanted to talk about it. I'm glad you wanted to talk about it because when I talk about Joe Biden's actions, what he's doing. This executive order came out that he is putting sanctions on four Israelis who are living in the West Bank. Am I getting that correct? That's correct. So why would a foreign government put sanctions on individuals like this who are already ha- Israel's already working on this? They're like the one guy I was reading about, he's already had a, an arrest and, and everything else. What does this mean once you have a foreign government saying, hey, we don't think you're doing this well, we're going to step in? Yeah, not only a foreign government, but an ally. So for example, right, yeah. when Putin invaded Ukraine, so we sanctioned people in Russia. And you can make an argument, we sanctioned too many people. And I've made that argument, not because I think that Russia is good by any stretch of the imagination, but when we're going to go reach and sanction people, there's gotta be a reason where we sanction people. There's not a judge, there's not a jury, there's some bureaucrat who sits someplace and passes a piece of paper for the president or the secretary of the treasury to sign off and that person's life is now frozen. Now- Well, and I, I have to say on the, I, I think Russia was a little bit different because we are looking at these oligarchs who had a lot of money. They were funding Putin and this is shutting off. Now, I mean, I agree. I think that it was an odd choice, but you could almost say, okay, well, maybe he did this because he thought I can shut off their access to their planes. I can shut off their access to their U.S. bank accounts. But these are four individuals. They're not wealthy. They're not funding the Israeli government. Why do this? Yeah, I didn't mean to go down that rabbit hole. The the argument I was trying to make is, look, we can sanction people in Russia because Russia is not going to sanction them. We want to push Russia. They don't have a judicial system. They hold our people hostage. So that is a tool that we use. But Israel is a robust democracy. It has a judicial system. It has a policing system. It works. If anything, it has a very left, I call it progressive and aggressive judicial system that prosecutes these people, including these four individuals, very well. The United States of America reaching into Israel's backyard and sanctioning these people is such an overreach. And it's such a threat to our alliance. It's almost difficult to articulate. Could you imagine for a moment that I would decide that there's somebody in the United Kingdom that on behalf of the United States of America, we don't like their politics. They jaywalked, they graffitied something. We're not talking about murder. We're not talking about robbery. We're talking about crimes that we don't like and they are not good crimes and they should be condemned. But we sanction somebody in the United Kingdom without the United Kingdom asking us to do that. This is such an example of a political twisting of facts and narratives in order to win votes in Dearborn. I mean, it's hideous. Well, I think that's the real question is why, what is the motive for doing this? Because this is distracting from why Israel is there. It's distracting from the work Israel is doing and the hostages that Israel is trying to get back. And so I see him doing this. And all of a sudden, all of the, the front page of every paper of every website is saying, an executive order comes out and Joe Biden is sanctioning. And I mean, if you're reading that quickly, it's like, why is he sanctioning Israelis? And that makes it look like suddenly we're not with you. 
you're no longer allies. I mean, to me, the optics of it are so bad. But the question I have is, if he's willing to do this, what what else is he willing to do? Is he going to destroy this alliance? I mean, he's also come out and he's we've heard that he said things about Netanyahu that have not been very nice. The prime minister there, he's gone after him and said that he well, we've heard that behind the scenes he's called him horrific things. I mean, the prime minister Netanyahu, he's calling an a-hole. You know, this is what we're hearing from his team. It's coming out. Where does that how does this how could this go a little bit further if you see him sanctioning individuals? What does he do next or what should we be worried about? Your question is exactly on point. And let me just articulate how morally perverse this is. I have a very good friend uh, who has a child who was injured in a terror attack in my neighborhood. There was a Palestinian terrorist who deliberately rammed a car into a school bus stop trying to injure as many 10 to 15 year olds as possible. And there's one child who's still in a coma, happens to be a dual citizen, an American and an Israeli citizen. That terrorist will sit in jail. That terrorist will be released at some point in time because that's what winds up happening here. That terrorist will not be sanctioned by the United States of America. That terrorist will receive a pension from U.S. taxpayer dollars because when we pay the Palestinian Authority, which Joe Biden does, that money goes directly to pay to slay, which is what that person did. And uh, contrast that with these four settlers who, again, I'm not condoning their behavior at all, but Israel has prosecuted them, arrested them, they will serve their time. And when they're done with that, they're frozen out of the entire Western banking system. That message that it sends to people who care about freedoms anywhere is devastating. And the slippery slope argument says, wait a second, I donated a prayer book to a synagogue that happens to be on the other side of the green line in the West Bank. Maybe they'll sanction me. You've been out to visit there. When you go visit the Cave of the Patriarchs, that's on the other side of the Green Line. Perhaps you're aiding and abetting. Maybe you're antagonizing. You're going to be on a watch list someplace, and there's no way to get off that watch list. Maybe they'll sanction you. Well, and that's the interesting thing. The one gentleman's mother was like, we don't do business in the United States. This doesn't affect us. But Prime Minister Netanyahu came out and said, made it clear, acts against lawbreakers everywhere, or acts against lawbreakers everywhere, so there is no need that Israel acts against lawbreakers everywhere. So there is no need for exceptional steps in this matter. And to me, this is like Big Brother coming in and being like, you know what? You don't handle this well, which I think is interesting because anytime you hear of another government trying to tell a government how to run, you have all of these people coming in and say, oh my goodness, are you colonizing? Are you saying they can't do it on their own? What are you, what are you trying to do here? But isn't this Joe Biden stepping in and saying, no, no, Israel, you don't have this right. I'm going to I'm going to punish these people for you. And because of that, I may have to do it further. That's correct. He is punishing Jews for living in Judea. That is what he's doing. And if you just look at it this way, South Africa took Israel to the International Court of Justice, accusing Israel of genocide. So the fact that South Africa has standing in the International Court of Justice just shows you that the International Court of Justice doesn't make any sense. But South Africa takes Israel to court, and through tremendous deliberation, Israel sort of won. How how do they win? They won that they've got 45 days to prove that they have not committed genocide, and everybody in Israel is like, well, that's okay. That's considered a victory. Why did South Africa take Israel to uh, International Criminal uh, Court of Justice? Well, because Iran told them to. Now, why is Biden sanctioning Israeli settlers? Who's telling them to do that? And I think it's in your backyard. It is, a, it is a naked pandering for votes that makes no sense. On the same day that he sent a team to Dearborn, Michigan, he sanctioned Israeli settlers. He said that he may unilaterally recognize the state of Palestine. And he said that Israel is over the top in their reaction to what happened on October 7th. All three of those I wouldn't expect from somebody neutral. I certainly do not expect from America, who I do believe that we are Israel's number one ally. Right. I think it you need it needs to be clear that these sanctions, like I said, his actions seem very much more politically motivated than executive motivated because these sanctions came just hours before they came to Dearborn, Michigan, which is well known for having a large Arab population. And people went, 
I mean, are you kidding me? Come on. But as I said, his poll numbers, he's lost 40 points with the Arab community. He's down from 59 to 70. So now he's willing to do anything to win. To me, there's nothing more terrifying than someone who's willing to do anything to win back power. And that is to even work against our allies. And his comment on Israel's response being over the top, I mean, the combination of those two things, announcing these sanctions on the day he's coming to meet with the Arab community, and also then saying that Israel is over the top when there are still hostages over there. They're still, Israel is still trying to get their people back. And this is what the president of the United States and ally says. I've seen nothing like this kind of pandering, but it's also so dangerous for our our, our allies, our knowledge of what's happening in the Middle East, our standing on the, in the world stage. I mean, it's a disaster. Even more than that, we still have six American hostages. If I were the president and I went mm. to an Arab community or an Asian community or a Jewish community, my argument would be we are going to stand with our ally who's going to get our people back. How is it possible, right, that they have this conversation about uh, hostage negotiations? And all you see is that President Biden is trying to get Israel to stop attacking the last holdout, which is Rafa, which is where all the hostages are. That's the same thing as asking Patrick Mahomes to kneel with the ball on the three yard line instead of trying to win the Super Bowl. You've gone all of the way. You're through overtime. And by the way, quit now because a tie would be fantastic. A tie in a Super Bowl is ridiculous. It's laughable. But a tie in a war means that Hamas won. Why would we want Hamas to win if it wasn't politically serving for somebody running for office. Well, I mean, that's what he has been saying. He wants a ceasefire. He says that he wants a ceasefire, but he even came out and said, I'm trying to negotiate this with Prime Minister Netanyahu, but he's giving me hell. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I would expect that from any leader who says, I, I have over a hundred of my people and six of yours. And I'm trying to get them back. What are you talking about, a ceasefire? Do you think that this is solely politically motivated? Or do you think he also is too mentally incapacitated to have the right advisor standing next to him saying, sir, we have an alliance. You can't do this. I'm more nervous about his advisors than his mental capacity. Mm. Uh, if you see the recently related uh, released documents by uh, by Powers, uh, in terms of in 2021, when Israel was at war with Hamas again, she refused to meet with the Israeli ambassador until there was yet another ceasefire. In other words, you have to pay in order to enhance the relationship with the United States of America. When Trump was running uh, United States foreign policy, that was certainly never the case. The, ob op the obligation was stand with our allies and the burden of proof was always on our enemies. Why aren't we holding Egypt to a higher standard? Uh, the King of Jordan was just standing next to President Biden, who simply said that this is 70 years of occupation and oppression. How does the President of the United States of America stand next to somebody who says that about our ally? That creates daylight. And that daylight is not filled by Costa Rica. That daylight is filled by Iran, China, and Russia. I'll just give you one example. These, these settler sanctions, uh, of which you correctly pointed out, lead to a slippery slope. The French have imported, have, have placed sanctions just today on 23 settlers. The mm. British have placed sanctions on 15 settlers just today. This has never been done before. President Biden says that we're going to unilaterally recognize a Palestinian state. The foreign secretary of the UK, David Cameron, says that immediately after. People will follow the United States of America for good and unfortunately, in this case, for bad. So what happens if... I don't think people understand the importance of the alliance with Israel. That is our one area of insight into the Middle East. We have been so tightly woven together because this is a a dangerous, constantly at war situation over there. And you have been our stronghold. Now we see that aid is likely coming, but that also includes humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Does that go to the people of Gaza? Yeah, it goes to the people of Gaza, but run by Hamas. So meaning that there are good people in Gaza, 
where they are. I don't know how we distinguish who they are. I don't know. Here's here, here's something that we just found out today. Israel in a daring raid saved two hostages just two nights ago, Super Bowl night, uh, in this incredible raid. If you haven't watched the video, mm -hmm. the, the Israeli soldiers literally placed themselves in between the hostages and the terrorists getting hit by bullets, using themselves to shield these hostages, where the exact opposite is Hamas hides behind civilians in order right. that way the terrorists don't get shot. So that's the that's the dichotomy at play over here. Um, they went to go rescue these hostages. The hostages come back, and I don't know if you remember, about 10 days ago, there was a big trade about medicine. They were going to give medicine to the Israeli hostages in exchange for uh, some more humanitarian aid going into Gaza. So what was reported? No humanitarian aid got to the uh, Israeli uh, uh, hostages, the, the hostages that were taken by Hamas. There was no medicine given to them. So there was an enormous uptick in humanitarian aid. The humanitarian aid was stolen by Hamas and no medicine got to, uh, to the Israelis who've been taken hostage now for more than 130 days. Do we have any updates from the people who have been released over time and rescued over time? Do you have any insight as to what was happening to them while they were over there? So a myriad of different reports. There's something on Twitter today, one of the very brave young women, uh, I'll probably tear up when, when I just even recall this, who, who, who spoke about the sexual uh, assault that she was under daily uh, while she was mm -hmm. kept hostage. Um, she was a plaything uh, for these, we'll call them people, that's an insult to humanity. Um, and she described what she went through. Uh, these two men that were just uh, liberated just two nights ago were essentially slaves to residents. They, they, they weren't held captive by Hamas officially. They were, they were guarded by Hamas, but they were put up in a regular residential house and uh, owned by regular residential people. Uh, the difference in between civilians and Hamas in Gaza is a blurry line. If you look at UNRWA, which was the, the story three weeks ago, the United Nations, more than 12 of the members who are paid for by us, we are the taxpayers who pay for UNRWA, participate in the massacres of October 7th. Immediately under UNRWA headquarters in Gaza is command and control for Hamas. It's, very, it's a complicated area. And when we, the United States of America, uh, blur lines, it gives the rest of the world the ability to go ahead and take a step back and say, you know what? There are dead babies here, that's terrible, which is true. Dead babies are terrible on every side. But nobody died on October 6th. On October right. 7th, Hamas declared war. Every single death, innocent and not, is, uh, should be uh, born in the responsibility of Hamas. So uh, it just seems though that people somehow they just gloss over that. They don't want to talk about it. And it, it's not just, I mean, we've seen, even here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I, we had a student that went out and was interviewing protesters who came out for a pro-Palestinian protest. He said, well, what about the women who are raped? What about the people who were burned alive? What about the people who had their babies killed in front of them? And they said, that never happened. That is yeah. such a lie. All those videos are fake. None of that happened. And I mean, these, you could tell for whatever, whatever had come to these students, very obviously early or late teens, early 20s, they believed this, that this didn't happen. It's so important that we continue the conversation. I mean, I think about all of these news stories that come and go. I mean, we talk about East Palestine, but we never go back and visit the people. We talk about Lahaina and the fire, but we never go back and visit the people. We talked about October 7th, which was the greatest, most horrific terror attack we've seen on Israel and, and the worst attack on Jewish people since the Holocaust. And yet these kids have not really been educated on it. And I think that we see this even with professors, which to me... I thought could never happen, that people could be so propagandized, that they could be so manipulated, that you would have professors who would say, no, no, that didn't happen. How do you fight that? Well, the professors are leading the charge. They're not following in this particular case. If you were to imagine a, you know, a, a, a PhD dissertation to be written about a person of a specific color does not belong in our university, that dissertation would be rightly rejected and that person would be escorted outside of the university because that type of talk thought has no place in any of our institutions of higher learning. 
But that same person, if they were to write a dissertation on the fact that Israel does not have the right to exist, not only would they receive their PhD, they would probably become the chair of their department and be feeded by all of the big donors and all of the people who support that university. This has been going on for the better part of 35 years. It's the canary in the coal mine. I, I, my daughter, whose dream was to go to the University of Pennsylvania. She, she's 13 years mm. old, she's very bright. She can get into likely any university she wants to. Uh, turned to me and said, I've got no interest in going there. That would have no appeal to me. And I, I turned to her and I said, why? She goes, well, they don't know the difference in between right and wrong. And if you're going to a place to learn about things that matter, if they don't know the basics in between right and wrong, so what do you care what they think about economics or history? That's likely also not correct. And then she said something that I thought was incredibly profound, which is if you can't tell the difference in between a man and a woman, how can you tell the difference in between Hamas and Israel? When, when you mm. give up on the very basics of what life is made of, okay, so everything, everything is fake. Everything is blurred. And if you live a life like that, it's, it's, it's sad and it's pathetic. My, my argument is not that President Biden shouldn't pander to the voters. My argument is why are there voters who want you to support Hamas? Mm. I think that's a very interesting point. If everything is fake, then what is real? Well, I, I'll tell you, I watched an ad during the Super Bowl. And I'm going to tear up talking about this because to me it was very real. The Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism put out a few ads. There was one where a mom walks out of her house and the little girl says hello to the, to the neighbor. And the mom's face changes and the little girl looks at the garage and says, what's that, mom? And it says no Jews and it has a swastika painted on their garage. And the mom's reaction was exactly how you would react as a mom because you're you got to get someplace and you have your daughter who is too young to understand there are people out there that hate you without even knowing you and how do you even have that conversation and she did such a great job of portraying that exasperation of i have to explain something so horrible to her and now it's happened to us and then the neighbor who watches this all happen when they get home, he's painted the garage. So the little girl doesn't have to see that again. But that to me is such a powerful message because I'm telling you every mom in America that watches that goes, ah. Oh, I get that. I know what that, yes, I understand that feeling. And I just wonder like, how do we make that just run wild? How do we get that knowledge out there? How do we educate people on what hate really is? Because I see these signs that say, hate has no home here, but nobody talks about what hate really is. Those people aren't actually talking about this. So that commercial was so spectacular. I have to tell you, as, as a very proud Jew, I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I believe I'm the only person who walked around the city as an identifiably Orthodox Jew from the age of like 11. I don't know why I did that, but that's what I did. And I ran into lots of people who made lots of different comments. Um, America has many, 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 many more of the people who have paint on their boot than the people willing to spray mm -hmm. paint that crap on the, on the door. And that's what makes America different than any other country in the history of the world. But the difference is, does it come from our leaders? And when our leaders mm -hmm. equivocate in between what is right here and what is wrong, this isn't, this isn't taxes. Should we pay 38% or 28%? This isn't Obamacare, this, this, this isn't any of those things. This is a question of can we inculcate within our community the difference in between good and evil? And if we can't decide on good and evil, you know, Germany was the most advanced country in the history of the world prior to Nazis taking over. What mm. they produced culturally, economically, scientifically was second to none in the entire world. America was chasing Germany. Uh, America has a choice in terms of which direction it wants to go. The Jewish people will be fine. Again, it'll be rough. We're used to things being rough. Uh, but the Jewish people will figure it out. I'm not particularly concerned about that. If America loses track of what's evil and what's not, then where are we going? Absolutely. I think what you just said was key, what your leaders do. I think it is your leaders and the media who covers the leaders because that to me has been so manipulated what we've heard about these stories and the leaders are allowing it and that that was really the difference when you saw donald trump in office when the media lied he called them out yeah but he was also the one out there that was standing with our allies and standing against endless wars 
I, I think that was just so profound what you said. It's something that you think about as a parent too. You know, what I do, they will do. It's the same. If you are the leader of the free world, what you do, they will do. You just talked about France. You just talked about the UK and the sanctions. That is exactly what needs to happen in all of those rooms when you've got all of these advisors in the situation room. You, know, you want to have the right ones there. If Donald Trump was president today, would we have six hostages under tunnels in Gaza today? And the answer to that is definitively not. It just wouldn't be the case. And I believe that all of the Israeli hostages would be returned as well. That there is no doubt that when if we don't lead on this issue, it's because we've chosen not to lead on this issue. We've chosen to, to be part of a solution, not the solution. And unfortunately, there is no part. We are the number one superpower. We are the leader of the free world. We cannot take second place. And right now we're playing for second place. And, and, and the results of that are very real. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate you coming on today to talk about this. I think that we have to continue to remind people what's going on. And, and just the conversation that we just had, it's so, so relevant right now, because we are about to make this decision come November, we are about to say, okay, what happens on the world stage will be decided by what voters come out in 2024, but they can only make that decision if they are educated, if they know what's really going on. And that comes from the top. And so that that kind of falls on the people around these campaigns to go out and, and really educate on the important things. And that is what's happening on the world stage because of what you just said. If America falls, if America takes the wrong step, then all of a sudden we don't have that. I mean, what you talked about with Germany, it's like when you put it that way, they were the leaders, you know, they had all of the technology. They had, they were going in the direction of, wow, these, this is the country that's really got something, but a radical mistake and how quickly the media and the propaganda could turn the people. That's what I think is the scariest thing is you think, well, okay, it's one guy, but when he has control of the media, he can turn the people and suddenly you lose everything you knew. Osama bin Laden was trending positively in the United States of America within the last 60 days. Osama bin Laden, here's one, I'll, I'll, I, don't, I don't need to leave you, but one, one of the, the silver linings of what's been going on over here in Israel, where I split my time six months here, six months in the States. Um, look, I. I sound old when I say this, but people don't have a lot of confidence in 15 to 25 year olds because they spend most of their time like this with their face shoved in a phone and scrolling and stories and Snapchat and TikTok and all the rest of this stuff. You want to talk about unbelievable human beings? Look at the 18 to 28 year olds here in Israel. Look at what they've been able to do over these past 130 days. Uh, they have, have surpassed anything that anybody could have expected of them. I, I know people who have been excused from their units who were fighting in Gaza for 75, 80 days, house to house, because Israel is not using their overwhelming air power, house to house in order to find hostages and to be able to eliminate uh, terrorists and to be able to protect Gazan civilians, putting themselves at risk for that, have buried their friends, have seen their friends get grievously wounded, who are now done with their service, who refuse to leave service because the job is not done. They cannot go home while there are still hostages in the tunnel. And here's a 22-year-old who should be on vacation in Thailand now after their army service. And they're strapping their boots back on and they're going back in and they're doing what they can in order to fight for freedom. We used to fight for freedom. Yeah, we did. Well, I hope that some of those 15 to 25-year-olds who have their head in their phones are starting to see those ads that we saw at the Super Bowl and that we can start to get in that space because I think that's the space that the reasonable voices, the truth, the light, that has not been in those spaces, sadly. My daughter came home from high school the other day and she was like, Mom, I had to do this project where I had to look, uh, and my daughter's 14, okay? So right in that age range, she's like, I had to look up all these different musicals for my my uh, choir class and as i'm looking them up every single one had a barack obama commercial that was saying vote for joe biden she's like and president Bur uh, president obama kept telling me to vote for joe biden and then sometimes joe biden would come on and they would talk to each other and she's like every single video and i'm like 
See, that that's where we're not paying attention. And that's where I love the fact that this ad campaign came out because I hope that it will reach those kids. Because here, I, I talked to somebody on the Republican side and I said, my daughter is seeing all of these ads. And he goes, oh, that's hilarious. It's the wrong demographic. She can't vote. And I said, you don't get it. No. It's the right demographic. Right. That's right. I don't know if I'd be too glib if I was saying she was looking up the musical Wicked because that would at, le- at least be on, on form. But we'll... We'll leave that perhaps aside. Well, we will. We'll see. I'll have to go back and see what she was looking up. But if we don't win the hearts and minds, if we don't win the culture, if we don't win any of these things, then then what are we going to do? We've lost the universities. We can retake the universities. Here, Here's the essential point. Going back to that ad, Americans are that neighbor who have paint on their boot. They are. Yes. And, and, and those are the parents of these kids. And if you who- haven't seen the ad, you have to look it up to know what he's talking about because it's amazing. Yeah. And I retweeted, you can find me Lightstone A on Twitter, on X on something. I actually tweeted something today or X something. I don't even know how to say that um, <laughs> from from the Golden Girls in 18 in 18 in 1987. I actually remember watching this live, which just tells you how sad that is. Uh, and I remember in 87, it was a it was a little scene of 90 seconds on anti-Semitism. And I remember that I was seven years old thinking, I don't know any anti-Semites. It's America. It's the 1980s. This doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And, and I retweeted that or re-ex- reposted that today because I wish people would watch that also. It's funny to watch. It's not funny. It's sad to see that it's still relevant. But that's the thing. I think that in the past, these things used to be a common conversation. We were allowed to have this conversation. And now we've. you're right. We've lost the culture. And that's what I keep saying. Uh, Republicans are trying to make politics the culture. That's where we're losing. We lost the culture, so therefore you lose politics if you try to run on culture that you've already lost. You know, you got to change things, and it can't come from politics. You couldn't be more right about that. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for being on here with me today. Make sure you check him out on X or Twitter or whatever we call it, Rabbi Arie Lightstone. Tell us again what your handle is. Uh, Lightstone A. Okay, awesome. And thank you all for joining us on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. For this episode and others, go to TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or head over to the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts and join us next time on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. Have a blessed day.